Uh, I put post-its on walls. <laughs> so that's all I do. This is, this is a group therapy session covering Martha Lane Fox's face with post-it notes, otherwise known as a retrospective. This is the Government Digital Service. And Martha's important in this story. Dame Foxy or Soho, Dame Lane Fox Soho. <laughs> um, she wrote a report. Uh, she'll kill me for that. Don't <laughs> Um, she wrote a report, uh, she was asked by the government uh, in the summer of 2010 to put recommendations forward about how to try and do this digital government thing properly. Uh, she wrote an exemplary report, mostly because it's only four pages long, and the clue is in the subtitle, which is revolutionary evolution. And her re re report, go and read it, it's really good, it's really brutal. Um, four recommendations in plain English. Start by fixing online publishing. Then go on and do the really hard problem, which is fixing transactions digitally. Do it properly. Build it on APIs so not only government has to offer these services, you can syndicate them properly. Uh, and in order to do this, you're going to need a new thing in the middle of government. That thing's called government digital service. That thing needs to have the power and authority to represent the user at the heart of every government service. Uh, so government digital service has the power to veto IT spend in anyway. government. Uh, we can actually detail appointments now at uh, senior levels. We have the authority over user experience. Uh, we're only two years old, we've got a long way to go. Quick overview of how we've tried to fix publishing. Some of you will know this. There was something in the order of 2,000 government websites no one's ever been able to count them definitively. That's not unusual. It took the BBC six months to count its websites. Um, there's on the way to being just one, that's gov.uk. Uh, this is my favourite page on gov.uk. If any of you have employed anybody and that and employees are lucky enough to get pregnant or their partners get pregnant, working out paternity um, uh, pay and, and dates is a nightmare. It takes about 20 pages of text to describe the actual legal rules for paternity pay. Um, I don't think you did this to do this. Someone, someone in GDS did a little calculator and you just like go, you know, this is the date, this is how long I've been working for the company. Um, these are, I can't remember, there's about five or six different variables. Um, uh, it's quite a complicated bit of logic, actually, but for the user, it's dead simple. And the thing I like, of course, it's a nice hackable URL, doing it properly. Um, we've also just moved 24 department sites onto gov.uk. Uh, and superficially, that's like, yeah, whatever, you've just moved a bunch of content. Well, we've sort of rewritten all the content, so it's plain English, we've got rid of 90% of it, because frankly it wasn't really needed. Uh, what we've also done is break the silo of publishing only in the context of a department. Because when you take something like the government's policy on Afghanistan, there are four different departments that actually have a big input into the government's policy on Afghanistan. And if you're a user, you want to see what the government's policy on Afghanistan is. So you can now, and you can see those four departments being represented. So we've kind of gone um, n-dimensional in our view of government, which now means that Martin Rosenbaum, who's the BBC's Freedom of Information correspondent, could suddenly tweet one day and bloody hell, I have to see all this Freedom of Information stuff just on one URL now. And there it is. All the info stuff. With an acting feed, that sometimes works. Um, and gov.uk, I think, is a good thing. It's still only early days, but we've done a thousand software releases in six months. We've done hundreds of thousands of content edits. We're accepting pull requests all the time. Um, and we just won design in a year, we beat the shard and the, um, that funny Olympics thing, whatever, something in the Olympics that people liked, but it wasn't as good as our website. <laughs> so if you want to go and see a you can go to the design museum, pay your £9.50 and go and see a website. <laughs> right, in some ways publishing is always going to be the easier problem, because transactions, you know, Getting your paying your tax, getting your benefits, making sure you're legal with your licenses and your car and whatnot. That's really where the pain of being a citizen in the UK and to engage with government really manifests itself. And for those of you who've had the joy of, you, of trying to do digital services with government, I think the polite way uh, of describing the quality of them is patchy. <laughs> uh, that's about as polite as I get. So over the last 18 months or so, we've been quite quietly GDS putting a lot of energy now, and it's now our core focus on 26 government services that we are working with 
departments. We can't do everything from GDS. We are working with other government departments and agencies to try and transform the quality of your digital experience when you're paying tax, when you're buying your driving license, uh, your, your, your um, vehicle tax, when you're getting your benefits, when you're trying to book a prison visit. So a lot of these services are not for people like you and I. And so hey, you design them very differently from the way you design things for yourself. Um, so we call those exemplars, we've got 26 of them. Some examples would be, if any of you have been unlucky enough to have a, a parent or a grandparent require power of attorney, um, you'll know that the application process, you literally get a sack of papers through the post. Right? You, get to, you have to put your name and address, I think, 24 times on that paperwork. You get a 40% error rate. So people make mistakes when they have to fill in things 24 times. So 40% have to go back before they even get processed. Surely the internet can help fix that. So we're working with the, uh, the public guardian, there's a man whose job title is, I am the public guardian. He has an office, <laughs> working with the office of the public guardian, uh, to transform that whole process. And this really isn't about the web, it's not really about technology, it's about fundamental digital transformation, to reorganise and realign whole businesses, really, to make the most of the digital opportunity. The fact that for many people, 84% of the UK online, they expect high quality digital services. To make those high quality digital services work, you often have to reinvent your business. That's hard. That's not really about technology. Um, rural Payments Agency, they pay money to farmers, about two billion pounds a year. Apparently the farmer gets literally a photocopy of their field and a crayon. <laughs> and funny enough, the accuracy is great and we get fined hundreds of millions of pounds by the EU for the lack of accuracy uh, uh, that is in that process. Um, <laughs> Eight weeks, a couple of hundred thousand pounds, good GIS, GIS skills from a couple of brilliant developers, <coughs> don't work for GDS. Uh, this is an alpha of the new Rural Payments Agency service. They kind of did it the way you do it. <laughs> it's, it's hard, but not that hard, you know what you're doing. Um, currently, this costs uh, every transaction for the Rural Payments Agency, every, every subsidy we pay to a farmer costs nearly 800 pounds to process. Um, well, the crayon to expensive. <laughs> 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 and uh, you can imagine the efficiencies we can get from this. And imagine if you're a farmer, all farms are online, apart from the old sheep, sheep farm, and we can help them. Um, send a car out to them. Um, the Land Rover. Uh, you can transform the quality of their lives too. Uh, we're also doing motoring. Where's Daffeth? Daffeth? We've sent the Welsh to the Welsh. Daffeth there is currently helping transform the quality of DVLA, uh, which is where all your vehicle tax gets paid, where all your driving licenses get uh, focused. They have more spaghetti than I've ever seen, and they're going to take a lot of fixing. Um, but again, uh, the benefits are huge. So, quickly, Martha's third edict was to do it properly. Um, so, to do it properly, you need to have some principles. And I think one of the most important things we've done in GDS. Uh, and the URL I give out most frequently is gov.uk slash design principles. How many of you have seen design principles? If you haven't, if you get one thing from this talk, go and have a look at gov.uk slash design principles. They are our Bible. They are the ten statements by which we live. And increasingly, they're the ten statements that we uh, see other good, clueful people in other bits of government, be that local or central, and indeed other organisations going, but that's how, that's how the government does it. Why can't we um, build for inclusion? Why can't we iterate and then iterate again? Why can't we uh, be open because it makes things better? They are very powerful principles, particularly if you stick to them. Um, one thing I'd like to say to you lot is importance of words. So, um, getting words so they're really simple and plain English. Uh, if you ever watch user testing, you can have the most elegant, clever, uh, service you like, a technology service you like, if people don't understand the words, you'll get nowhere. We have some of the best writers in the world working for government now. They've written a style guide. Particularly, you'll go have a read. There's a list of banned words, which is brilliant, very powerful in government. Um, we've also said no to apps, because they're proprietary. We've got big with responsive design, uh, uh, HTML5, so we've literally put a fatwa on apps. They have to, I personally have to approve all of them. Um, so I don't prove many. Um, uh, again, if you're in an organisation where people are going, we need an app for that, 
don't have a look at our blog and read why you probably don't need an app for that and say, even the government's worked out we don't need an app for that, surely <coughs> we don't need one. Sometimes you do, but mostly we don't. Uh, we obsess about good URLs. We've had more arguments about URLs uh, than almost anything else in the government. That's the way it should be. Um, and we really try hard not to break the web. And Jordan's going to be talking about how we do that in a minute. So while we have turned off dozen seem to be hundreds of websites. We have broken, we've potentially broken hundreds of thousands of links. Uh, we've actually broken virtually none, hopefully none, because we've been uh, really fastidious and angrily attentive about redirection, deep redirection, and Jordan will talk about that in a minute. We draw diagrams like this, with words like MongoDB on. I have had fellow civil servants genuinely accuse me of taking the piss. <laughs> I say, well, <laughs> um, I have sympathy, you know, it, it is a really, very different world from someone who's worked for 40 years in the civil service. It's a completely different context. Uh, and you have to respect that. Uh, and it's really important to respect the fact that the civil service uh, are full, is full of incredibly diligent, hardworking people who come from a different place than we do. Uh, those are brilliant, brilliant people in the civil service. Um, all our code's open source. Uh, to on GitHub. Uh, if you see something wrong, just give us a pull request. Don't moan about it until you put a pull request in, please. Um, <laughs> uh, really. I've just got a friend in the States who's sent me an email going, you spelled Middlesbrough wrong. It's been in 43 places. Of course, it's going to be UK. You have the great pleasure of going, you put a pull request in. And Mike Butcher from Tech, tech, um, tech Crunch say, why are there no social media share buttons on your e petition service? I send an email back going, I'm sure you can code that in. Taxpayers' money, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, a load of questions as well about it's all open source, isn't that dangerous? Isn't that brave? That's very brave, you hear a lot. <laughs> well, um, anyone recognise that? That's Cheltenham, that's where the speakers live. And CESG are the cyber speakers. Um, and I have to say, one thing that's really reassured really me they're really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> and there's not enough of them, but they're really good. And, um, their chief techie is a fantastic bloke called Ian Levy. If anyone who gets to hear, to hear Ian Levy speak, he's absolutely fantastic. And he was responsible for my favourite tweets, I think probably in the last couple of years. Ever read that? <laughs> so I think that's done the trick. <laughs> Make sure Twitter doesn't break its links. Um, don't screech up. So, uh, again, more seriously, we are, we can't do all this from an office full of about 200 people in Hoban. Okay, this is about transforming government. Really, it's about reinventing public services in the context of digital. And so, we have to help the rest of government understand that there's a, a better way of developing services that's pretty fundamentally different from the way that we've been doing things things for the last 20 or 30 years. You know, we've had eight systems integrators with about 80% of the X billion pounds that government's been spending. You know, Parliament calls that an oligopoly. It's a fundamentally different approach to actually design the services properly. And so we just published a design manual which describes how you go about designing services. It'll tell you, um, oh, let's have a look, um, you know, how to, uh, how to be agile, how to do DevOps. Um, the kind of people you need, it's got job descriptions in there. It's literally meant to be uh, a, a manual for how you go about reinventing yourself as a government department, government agency, uh, uh, to deliver in this way with, this, with the kind of quality that we need. Um, again, I really recommend if any of you can have a look at it. We'd love some feedback on what does, if it works or doesn't work for you. Um, a lot of interest in that, and we'll keep putting a lot of effort into that because I say we can't do everything ourselves. Finally, I thought I'd give a little bit of a tour as to what it feels like to be a, uh, a manager in GDS, because it's interesting. Um, so superficially, um, from a distance, it kind of looks like the civil service. There are people with computers looking hard working. If you look a little bit closely though, you'll see some differences. That's a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> that Mac costs 18% uh, of the cost of its 
predecessor, which was a 10-year-old laptop that took half an hour to boot up. Okay. So it's less than a fifth the cost of the thing it replaced, which is now in and hopefully somewhere. Um, that woman is a developer. She's terrifyingly good, Frances. Um, but actually, if you look around a bit more, that's, it doesn't take you long to realise there appear to be inflatable palm trees in the office and, and uh, our delivery managers wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Um, but there are also people wearing bowler hats without irony. <laughs> <laughs> and genuinely, this is Mark. He doesn't do that for a joke. He wears that every day. Um, there, were, there were fluffy toys that I know. I'm allowed to pick this one up, okay? But I'm not allowed to pick this one up. I mustn't touch the badger. When I pick the badger up, there are people in this room, Sam, Nick, who'll shout at me for picking the badger up, because that's the badger of deploy. And only those who've got the badger of deploy can deploy. So I have had genuine discussions with people about what do we do if someone steals the badger of deploy? Do we have a little glass case on the wall with a mini badger in it? <laughs> More comfortingly, even though we have stacks, we have a comforting sight of a grumpy developer with a beard. I'm kind of happy with that. But then there are people who go out of the office and take photos of themselves in front of street signs. I don't understand that, and I don't understand why all our cakes are black. <laughs> and then when I try and throw away cups, I get told to stop because they're art. And there's a big red button, and I'm not allowed to press it. And other people are. There are stickers that I have to censor. <laughs> There's a minister who takes me aside and tells me in great detail what's wrong with the student loans website. That's new. <laughs> More seriously for a second. We're doing this because we've got a minister who passed this board who knows what a bad website looks like and knows what a good website looks like and knows broadly what it takes to fix it. That's not a party political statement. That's just reality. Okay. Um, um, uh, I'm sure, yeah, I will stop there, but we couldn't do this without backing the ministers. You can't change the civil service without backing. Um, uh, and we've had Francis Moore's back. Um, well, jokingly, there were things like this. With like flashing lights and curtain graphs and things, and I don't know what they mean, but the numbers change. And then there's really scary things like this, which says currently failing and lots of words I don't understand. And every so often, one of those things will go from bed and a developer will commit Harry Carey. <laughs> Fail the test or something, and then there's like these like weird art around the office that you find. This is some art that just appears on cards, like lying around, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> but everybody seems to go, yeah. <laughs> and then there's a bin that's not a bin. I'm not allowed to put things in this bin. This is the bin of done, and only stories can go in the bin of done. And I don't know what a story is. It's like a card with words on it, but apparently they're very special. The bin have done. And then there are other cards that say, use HTTP methods as Roy intended. And then when I ask, why is Roy scribbled out and Tim put there, the person next to me says, well, Tim came and he said it was him that did it, not Roy. And, I, and then when I ask who Tim is, they look at me with pity. <laughs> <laughs> What's actually best to about working for GDS as a manager uh, is you get to enable things like this to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think Daphne's here, I don't think Maz is here, it's a shame, I'd like to humiliate her as well. Um, but seriously, getting people like Maz and Daphne into Downing Street, um, unaccompanied, <laughs> is a source of huge pleasure and pride, and they actually get listened to, and we are actually changing things. And we're changing things because we're really about making life for users that little bit less shit. Thank you. Jobs and Jesus. Here's my uh, privi chair privilege. Just to ask you, I guess, two questions. Is one, uh, questions. questions for me. Style guide. Yep. Is that style guide going out to all of government non-digital stuff as well? Uh, when you actually look at how much non-digital communications governments do, in terms of how much, how many words are actually read by people, it's pretty much all digital anyway. Which leads to my second question: uh, digital divide. I mean, you said most farmers are on uh, online, but actually, rural broadband is known to be a bit rubbish. 
So how are we still kind of managing the expectation of the digital divide and, and is that still an issue? Uh, it's still an issue. Uh, just to get some facts right, um, there are more people online in the countryside than in towns. Okay, so getting your facts right is really, really important. Uh, if we were building digital services that required high definition video, I'd worry, but with fish stick about file size and it'll work on you know, 512, fine. Um, there are about 16% of the UK that are not online. Some of those will never be online. And we put, uh, we're putting a lot of effort into working out how do we help those people. You know, HMRC have people in cars who go around all week and help people do their tax returns if they can't get out of their house. Um, we have uh, relationships with people like uh, uh, Go On Trust, we talk to the post office about how do we help people use digital services. But I think to use that as a reason for not trying to make the 84% of people's lives that much better is a bit of a straw man. Uh, 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 so no, there is an issue, but it's not. We shouldn't mean we don't make our lives, the 84%, that much easier. That's why I just needed that bit of information. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is like an eager hand. It, there are all these hands. Like this guy had it up first, and he was ages. So you know, those of you at the back, you weren't. Um, the Department for Education is changing its GCSE syllabuses, in particular computer science. Uh, it's asked for feedback from the public via its website. Uh, the website went down in June 2012, and it was only brought up online because I asked my MP to ask the Minister why the website was down, and it came back on the 18th of March. So the government's website was down for eight months during an important consultation period. Could I have your comments, please? <laughs> yeah, that's not good enough. I think the, um, uh, the quality of uh, and the capability within the government uh, to know what it takes and to know how important it is to run digital services the way they should be in 2013 when 84% of the UK rely on them, uh, is lacking. And if you read the government's digital strategy, which was published in November last year, uh, it really is all about the capability within the whole of the civil service to make sure we do have the kind of people who understand how important it is that you don't let a consultation disappear for nine months, because that's not acceptable in 2012, let alone 2013. Um, but the reality of knowledge and understanding across an enormous organisation like the civil service is that it's really very patchy, and that a lot of the knowledge went out of the door with the outsourcing of the 90s into the hands of system integrators. Uh, and the government's relationship has been a contractual one, uh, not, a, and not, not a relationship of equals, I'm afraid. We've not been buying services in an intelligent way from even when we have outsourced. Uh, and we are needing uh, a whole slew of new capability, new people inside government across departments, um, including education, uh, who can bring the skills that are needed to run the services to the quality that's required. Um, some of those people may be in this room. So if you follow at GDS Jobs, uh, uh, we're always hiring. But no, in answer to your question, that's not acceptable, full stop. Thanks, Tom. I'm, I'm now from behind, uh, and there was questions back here. So, Terence. Hi there. Um, I completely uh, sympathise with your attitudes towards IE6, fight and power. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm slightly confused why you prioritised doing a site like DVLA, which works, or which worked on modern browsers, when it's impossible to claim benefits in this country with anything newer than IE6. If you go to the DWP site, it tells you, oh, you're on Mac or Linux or using something newer than XP downgrade. Why prioritise a site which already works on modern browsers with one against one which doesn't and is arguably used by a lot more people? So, so we, are, um, we are not doing that, to be clear. We are working very closely with our colleagues in the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, the, uh, Oh, and we're working very closely with colleagues in DVLA. Um, and if you talk to some of the GDS people who are around, some of them will tell you more detail about how we're working with DWP. Uh, all I'll say is that some of the contracts uh, 
that government has signed are more problematic than others. Uh, and um, the more problematic ones are very problematic. <laughs> I mean, I think it's in the public domain that, you know, changing a word on a government website costs up to £50,000 and takes six months. A word. That's the kind of contracts we're doing. So, gentlemen here. Dave. Do you see uh, these wonderful principles that you've come up with for national government percolating down to local government? Uh, I live in Camden, this online services are fine, some of the back-end processes are torturous, uh, but they could do a lot better. Do you, do you, see, you, do you see yourselves franchising this out to local government? Uh, constitutionally, well, constitutionally it, it's not central government's job to tell local government how to run their services. Um, uh, though they may argue that that's not the reality on the ground, but that's, that, that, that is the, the state of play. Um, we are, however, spending a lot of time um, sharing our stuff with local government. I spoke to a Socketon conference the other week, uh, and if you talk to our developers and designers, they're always popping up to Camden. In fact, there was a Camden thing the other week, on Friday there was a hack day. Uh, and there's a huge groundswell of interest and excitement in um, uh, I've dotted around the country, sometimes deep within the bowels of local authorities. Um, but the same problems I talked about earlier, I don't want to be too negative, but these are big problems of the way that government has been, local government as well as central, procuring digital services as if we're buying a motorway bridge. You know, we're buying something that we know absolutely everything about, we're buying it for 20 years, it will never need to change because you know everything about it and the contract is with an outsourced supplier, but we don't even know what continent the developers are in. I mean, I literally, you are a great question to ask someone, do you know what continent your developer is in? Often the answer comes back, we don't know. Uh, those problems are also prevalent within local authorities. Um, but the same energy and uh, impetus that you hear about, from, hopefully from us, is present, and it's present in Camden, I know it is. Um, there's energy that's present in Shropshire, there's a fantastic bits of work we've done in Shropshire, uh, in Warwickshire, in Lincolnshire, dotted around the country. Um, it's got a long way to go there, there were 400 local authorities. Uh, and there's no real centre for local authorities. That's why they're local. So, I'm ignoring that side, because it seems that all the brains are on that side and nothing on this side. <laughs> Come on. So, in the middle. Um, my question to you is, where's the old content? You know, it looks like it's been shortened a fair bit and perhaps dumbed down. And I'm currently getting a divorce. No, I'm not. But if I were, I would want to read the long version. And because the legislation is complex, I'd like to know all about it somehow. And not the do this, do this, do that, and you're done version. So never design for yourself. So would I if I was getting divorced. I'd want all the detail, I'd want the legislation. Um, the average reading age in the UK is 12. Okay? And um, most people aren't like you, I'm afraid. I wish they were. They might get divorced a bit less. Um, uh, the detail is there. We have a, a format on the site called Detailed Guidance, which will have chapter and verse on you know, the detail of getting divorced and, and the edge cases. But one of our design principles was to optimise, optimise, I use the word carefully, for the common case. And uh, when you sit and watch user testing, when you sit and realise that people don't read on the web, they don't actually read, they scan. And you have to design for the fact that people scan, they don't read. Uh, you realise quite quickly that you need a star guide that says, it's not dumbing down, it's writing plain English, frankly. Uh, it's writing simply and clearly, and it's hugely difficult to do that in a way that is accurate uh, uh, and is understandable by people. One of the tests we run, and I recommend anyone doing any kind of content stuff do this, we run uh, a series of quantitative tests, remote testing with several thousand people, about 2,000 people at a time, where we set them a series of tasks. We could say, what do, you, what do you need to do to get divorced? And we see whether they find the content on the site, uh, and then they, we ask them, you know, do you think you understood what you have to do? And they'll you know, you say yes or no. And then we do a little bit of kicker at the end, that we ask them a question that really gets underneath, whether they did understand what they were meant to do. So what are you going to do now? Be the question. So you really see whether they actually understood or not. 
And so um, and when we looked at comparison between direct gov, so business link, and, and, and the simpler content on gov.uk, the actual understanding of the right thing you were meant to do for that task was vastly greater. Um, so yes, I understand why someone like you and me would want all the detail under the sun, but we're not, we're not the common case. Uh, and the detail is there if you look harder. The search isn't good enough yet. We're working hard on the search of the UK. That needs a lot of work still. Um, but we're not, we are not the audience. We are not the users. I'd also add on there to look at legislation.gov.uk, um, which is incredibly good if you really do want to get into the detail of law. Now this side is won by persistence. Uh, Fabian uh, has got a question here, but I also want you to think about Jordan. You know, Jordan is here to uh, share, give him some love, but Fabian. A more general thing, and uh, not, not being from the UK originally, I gotta say I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with what you've done, and I just wanna know how the heck did the UK government actually hire people that seem to know what they're doing? <laughs> <laughs> How can, uh, can other governments do the same thing in Europe, possibly? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jordan doesn't it, have to answer that one. I'll tell you what, it took about 10 years of people like people in this room cornering politicians of all flavours and colours and parties and not shouting at them, actually. And sitting down and calmly explaining that there was another way. And it literally took 10 years. Uh, and it's people like Tom Steinberg uh, who created the opportunity for this to happen. Uh, and it also took, bluntly, a younger generation of ministers who actually use the web a lot and know about the website when they see it. Uh, and I suspect that will happen in other countries too. And the real change happens when you've got a minister like Francis Maud who's got children who are going to university and the poor bastard has to use the student loans website. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone's ever tried, you know, we are in the process of working really closely with those colleagues. I think that's going to fix that, but it is it's challenging. Uh, but the, re the real answer was it took a lot of time for people not screaming and shouting, calmly talking to politicians about the fact that there is another way. And eventually, the word, the, you know, it got through. Okay, we've got Paul here, and then there's Chris over there. This side is finally got its act together. You're going to be disappointed in me because I'm going to be queen. My question to Alan Williams. Oh, that's a redirect. Very much. I, I was talking to some people at the cabinet office a little survey about six to nine months ago, and I noticed that it was all hosted in California. And then I got very upset and got into a dialogue as to why am I speaking to my government? through something in California, which is subject to the US Patriot Act. And it's not just a matter of having the services located in England, but also not hosted by companies. UK companies are subject to the US Patriot Act and all the privacy that that involves. So what are we doing about it to keep my data private between me and my government and not visible by the CIA or whoever? So I'm glad you spotted that the US Patriot Act is a truly incredible piece of legislation. And actually where your data is hosted is, is totally moot when it comes to the Patriot Act. Uh, if it's a company that has any activity in America at all, uh, uh, the Patriot Act applies. And I'd recommend anyone who, who's interested in it to go and have a really good look at the Patriot Act because it's very interesting. Uh, and I'm a civil servant so I'll leave it at that. Um, in terms of hosting stuff, um, uh, being DPA compliant is really important, uh, but also using you know, DPA compliant can mean in Europe, and uh, there are lots of providers who uh, offer hosting in Europe, uh, and some of those providers are fantastic, and we use them a lot. Uh, and using DPA as a weapon to say you need your own tin, you need your own data center that costs three or four orders of magnitude more than uh, an EU compliant hosted environment it is the kind of trick that we're wise to now. We've had hosting, um, we had quotes from existing suppliers for hosting of four million pounds and then we go out of our G Cloud cloud framework to hundreds of suppliers and you get it for 40 grand. Both are DPA compliant uh, uh, so we're careful about not using DPA as an excuse to say things can't change. But hosting surveys in the States, 
private information on? Is that actually this date? Yeah. So, uh, Chris, I hope you're going to, this is the last question slash comment. Make sure this side comes out a winner. <laughs> I think I can only disappoint now, no matter what I do. Um, I have a question about uh, things like um, universal credit. That's not something that's been delivered by you guys at present, uh, and it's by some of the other big SI, big systems integrators. How are you managing the relationship and the transition from there to there? Because my understanding is that some of the, some of the existing SIs are kind of, they're, they're, they're fairly long running contracts between now until year X, really. Uh, universal credit is an incredibly important government policy. Thank you for your question. <laughs> okay, we have one more. Uh, hi, uh, Jordan. Hi. Um, Yay! So, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I would, I've been you know, reading the GDS blog this afternoon, and when you were talking about the tools you were developing, you went through a couple of different uh, tools and frameworks to, to get something in place that worked for you. Yeah. And on your blog, you get there's a big list of all the different kinds of uh, pieces of software and frameworks that you use to, to deliver a load of stuff, and that's really, really great for the developers. But do you ever have the overriding, overwhelming fear that there are 30,000 frameworks and languages within GDS? And so at some point, something's going to break, and the person who wrote it is going to be left. Um, I might have this question to Sam, because I think he knows, <laughs> he, well, he can probably answer it a little bit than I did. Um, so, do you want to explain who you are, Sam? So, just for the record, I'm not actually a developer at GDS. Um, I work on the infrastructure team, so I deal more with the operations. And yes, that scares me. <laughs> um, the important thing about writing software is to make sure it's good. It doesn't matter what framework it's written in, and we do have four or five major things that we write stuff in. That doesn't really scare me. It would have done about two years ago. Um, mainly because everything we write is tested well, um, it's documented, all of this is automated, all this testing. So when it goes into production, I don't generally get that nervous. Unless, so, well, I get nervous sometimes. Um, late night deploys make me nervous. Uh, deploys on a Friday afternoon when I want to go to the pub make me nervous, but I'm not nervous about the, the number of things we write code in. That's just, it's not an issue anymore. It's all about writing code well and getting smart people to write it. I love that sort of team kind of effort. Uh, thank you to Jordan, thank you to Tom, and also thank you for excellent, excellent questions. Uh, big round of applause.